Welcome to the HMO podcast channel. And today we are going to talk with Maria Luisa, who in 2018 was in the fortunate position of being able to leave her day job to focus on property full time at the same time as uh, raising her young daughter. And we're going to hear Maria Luisa's story. So welcome, Maria Luisa. Hi, thanks for having me. I think a good place to start rather than just launching straight into HMOs is could you tell us a little bit about your background before property, Maria Luisa, and what we what you were doing for a living? Um, so I have a law degree, a UK law degree, and I was working in the legal sector for about five years full time before we jumped into uh, property. I had quite a few of um, cases um, when I was working with tenants and I was supposed to be on the tenant side. Um, so it's mainly repossession or repairs. Um, a little bit of environmental health was involved as well. But um, to cut a long story short, after just a few cases, I realized that maybe I should be on the other side. Yes. Okay. And uh, what steps did you take having had that realization from there? Um, so because me and my husband, we've been talking about what we should do um, sort of in the long term, because um, what I was doing, it was fine, but it wasn't really uh, me because it's quite repetitive. Um, even if you specialize in any particular uh, legal field, and the way the UK uh, system is based is that you want to specialize in one particular field. So if you're employment solicitor, that's all you're going to do all day long for the next 45 years. You will only do employment cases. You can't do anything else. So um, and you once you decide what it is, you can't really change unless you it's incredibly complicated. So you just specialize and you become a master of that art. And yeah, and then you die from boredom, um, probably a lot sooner than 75. So we were talking about how well we can do. And it all started, as everyone else probably did, with um, Rich Dad Poor Dad. We were driving in the car somewhere and I put it up and I started reading it out while we were driving somewhere for two hours. And it was the, that was definitely the starting point. Yeah, it's uh, amazing how many times I hear the rich dad, poor dad story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it also landed on my desk in, in similar circumstances <laughs> as well. So uh, yeah, I can always resonate with that. So yeah. having read that book, um, I think your mindset was that, yes, I want to do this or I want to try and get into property. So what were your next steps after that, Maria Luisa? So for about two years, we have been actively preparing. So we chose our area, uh, we decided on our patch and then we read everything there is. So I have I have all the books by all the more or less famous or not so famous property people in the UK and USA. Um, so I read all of them, we, li we listened to all the podcasts I could find, but actually back then, five years ago, so I started looking into this in 2014, so that was what, seven years ago, there actually wasn't many podcasts on, on the subject, um, there was one main one, you know, the most famous one, and then um, there was one more, uh, like a more UK one, and a uh, USA one, and there's an Australian one, which weren't particularly relevant, and then just land forums, and then uh, and then at the end of the day, I said, you know, we're just going to buy it and we're going to figure it out. Yeah, I, I was going to say there's a lot of people in property who they start educating themselves, but they carry on in education mode and they keep reading and learning and reading and learning, but often don't ever take the plunge. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think you get to a point, don't you, whereby you've got all the information, uh, you know where you want to get to you know that the journey is never going to be clear and that you're going to need to adapt on the way and you need to, you need to dive in. So tell us, um, Maria Luisa, about the, your, your first property opportunity and talk us through that. So 
basically we were moving out of London because we were based uh, in London, not just for particular for property, but it helped that, um, you know, what we wanted to do, it wasn't, it wasn't quite feasible in central London. So we moved out into Southeast and we had an option of either buying like, like a mid range 300 uh, something semi, like a three bedroom typical family house, which most Londoners actually buy where we are as a family home because we were married by then uh, or we could have bought two terrible uh, a little bit damp ridden uh, terraced houses and we will then move into one live there do it up while we were there at the same time try and buy another one um, and then in two years time we will have two by two leds and hopefully we'll figure out where we're going to live and that was our original plan when we bought our very first one wow okay so <laughs> so rather than taking it slowly putting your foot in the water you decided just uh yes yeah decided to buy two in the space of three months is a lot better than buying one yeah <laughs> that's what we did yeah we bought the first one in july 2016 and the second one we completed in October 2016 but in hindsight it was the best it was the best decision ever because since then uh the price has gone just through the roof so I just wish I could have bought more but I was literally I was really straight out I was yeah we didn't have much money much money to go on a shopping spree Wow. Yeah, it's always one of those things with, with hindsight, isn't it? I, I always find with property that there's always this kind of feeling that, you know, there's a property crash or correction just around the corner and there's always a level of uncertainty. And I think it's because property prices are so high in the UK. You know, invariably, they just carry on going up and up, don't they? Yeah, well, so. I know that um, there is a very uh, quite famous property person. Um, she's actually also based in Bristol. And she says the best the best time to buy property is 20 years ago. The next best time is now. And, and I, I, I think the same. As long as the numbers stack up, that is. Yeah, no, that's a great saying. Um, yeah. So uh, carry on with the story then. So you had these two properties. How did it evolve? From so we had two properties. So we moved into the first one. It was uh, it, my, my first one, as you would imagine, wasn't my best buy ever. But that's just something. It's not terrible. Uh, it's OK. It's like a bit of a mediocre. It could have probably the location wise is great. Um, because the reason why I bought it is I thought, well, we're going to live it in. Hopefully it hasn't got too many issues. So it was kind of livable. And you don't really know what you're looking at, even though you read all these books, you um, you read all, you know, listen to all these podcasts, you don't really know what you're doing. So we bought one. Uh, obviously it had damp through the roof and um, even though we did a survey we did but later you'll find out that the surveys were useless and um, they said yeah there's a bit of damp but how much is the damp going to cost could be 500 pounds could be 10 grand I don't know we don't really know so, so anyway it's a, it, it turned out all right because it was on 10% deposit um, but it wasn't my best buy but that's just something you have to prepare you know you will never be you will it will never be your best buy on your first try so it's just a, something you have to make your peace with um, and then so we at the same time I knew because even because we lived in there I thought even if it's terrible at least we have somewhere to live really cheap we can save money while we're there we won't lose any money on it and worst case scenario uh it will be like a nice simple single let and then at the same time once we bought that one i went looking for a hmo one so the first one was sort of maybe hmo maybe single let because it was 10 percent deposit it didn't really matter because i was buying with 10 percent um, but the second one, I went one full on prepared. It needs to be a perfect HMO. And I was looking to so have like a ideal formula that I'm looking for. So it needs to be a terraced house, at least three story. I did it like a tower. So you've got like two rooms on each floor. And yeah, it took me two months roughly to find one and then we found it and it's gone up uh, since it was last bought only two and a half years ago by they wanted almost 40,000 more and I was like I can't believe it I can't believe they want that much in just two years and it's also like a terrorist terrible one that 
then I was like, you know what, if we're not going to buy this one, even though it's obscene, the whole idea, you know, that you're paying someone for not doing anything to the house 20 grand a year, doesn't sit quite well. But I was, I remember talking to my husband, Josh, and I was saying, you know what, I just have to make my peace with it. We can make money. The numbers work up. The, um, the yield is working. It's perfect layout. We're going to do it. And he's like, so you're happy with the fact that you probably were paying? I was like, we're going to make it work. It will be fine because the yield is there and it will be all good. So that's what we did. We, we bought it. Okay. And um, tell us about uh, how, how, you, how you took this property and, uh, and converted it to uh, an HMO and a little bit about the challenges that you faced behind doing that, given that it was your first conversion. Yeah, it was first conversion, but also as it happens, I decided to do the hardest way. Uh, it was right in the middle of Article 4 with a very nice and friendly council uh, that hated the whole, whole idea of any more HMOs because they let another part of town uh, really down with awful, awful HMOs all over it. And now suddenly they woke up, they was like, oh, what have we done? And they decided to be really anti-HMO. And everyone, everyone said, don't do it. I was like, okay, I listened to all of your advice and decided I'm going to do it. <laughs> and uh, so we, the plan was, it was a long-term plan because I didn't know the council and lots of people, even still now in property groups and everywhere, they say article four, you know, like stay away, so complicated, maybe not worth it. And back then, like six years ago, almost five years ago, it was even more scary because there wasn't like even all the forums that weren't really as active as they are now. So I thought, well, worst case scenario, um, we will have to appeal because I have legal background, even though I am, you know, not like a planning application specialist. I read all the thing around it and I was like, well, we're just going to have to try it, don't we? Even if we don't get the planning, if we get it right. I, I found the local plan. I found, uh, you know, the decision, uh, how to make a decision. Um, for to grant an application and I was like and then I know there was one more other I saw one uh, there was literally one and only person who said well we did it and if we didn't get it we appealed and we got it and I was like okay we've got one precedent it's all good we have one example somewhere up north who didn't get planning and we're going to follow it so the plan was you buy it on a normal buy to let for two years fixed uh, let it as a normal single let you because of the you can convert while on a normal buy to land mortgage and we will ask for planning permission and once the permission is granted and two years later the mortgage is up somehow we're going to remortgage the house on the correct product and we will convert it and then rent it out and it will be all great but it's two years down the line so we'll figure it out later so <laughs> that's what we did okay that that, that that's Quite commendable. I, I, so I guess your risk level, um, had you not got the permission, is you would have ended up with a house that you would have need, needed to keep on a buy-to-let basis rather yeah. than an HMO. So whilst you wouldn't necessarily lose money, you would have had that money tied up, generating... Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be, it, it, you, you wouldn't be exactly... We did have sort of exit strategy. I, I like how everyone says you need to have an exit strategy. Well, yes, you do. But before... But when you're very new your exit strategy is sort of like a bit of a watermark strategy it's not really a strategy because you don't really know there's so many other things that can come or actually two years is a long time i don't know maybe you'll have a pandemic maybe you'll lose your job you know who knows um so the plan was um because it was 25 percent, even if it was a single air it wasn't it wasn't great but it would have been like a vanilla very basic you know, we'll be right. You wouldn't lose any money. Well, you wouldn't. You wouldn't probably quit your job after that one house. But you know, I was thinking, well, maybe we can then try Airbnb, or maybe we can split it into flats. There was, you know, there were other options where you can do with a house. As long as you have a house, that would be fine. Okay, so you got the you got the planning permission, and yep. then you you started doing the work. You mentioned there were other HMOs uh, in in this particular area, and I'm thinking that you were well aware of that. What was your plan or strategy and what gave you confidence that you would be able to, I guess, be bigger and better than the, the other properties uh, in the area? 
So I did go and check other HMOs before. Um, so I got the list from the uh, the council of all the registered HMOs and written to all of them. You know, that's that's what they teach you to do, um, just to have a look. But I came as uh, as a potential buyer. But then I came. I saw one more advertising, so I went there as a tenant. I might have went as a pretended tenant to a couple of them, uh, just to see how good are the state agents. What kind of um, you know how well they're managing it. They're all terrible, by the way, all, all of them, including the state agents. They didn't know anything about the house at all, the one they were letting. And so I had a, when I look and I was like, hmm, there was a bit of a concern because the only HMOs that were there, they were really sort of like horror TV HMOs, you know, with um, like animals, animal smell everywhere and holes living and it's never been cleaned and the bathrooms were just they were just like sickening to even go past that bathroom and mainly people there they were on benefits or I don't know factory workers I think that's what he said and so the overall idea that you know you can just go into this area with this awful HMOs and create something a lot better will you have a demand question mark well now I know that you do because I finally figured out a formula how to figure out if you have a demand there um but back then I didn't know so what back then people were saying that you should have on suite so if you have an on suite HMO then automatically you will probably attract better clientele and I haven't lived in the area myself for a long time so it's not like I know how good it was uh, in terms of, you know, potential candidates. So I knew it wasn't terrible, but I wasn't really sure because you can't really tell. And everyone who lived in the area said, oh, God, it's your most awful, isn't it? It's just, I don't know how people live in them. That was the overall, that was the overall um, perception. I mean, to be honest, most of the council still think that HMOs is just something only desperate people live in. And um, the majority of people sort of 45 plus or think the same. They just, you know, with the fairies, they, they don't really understand what's going on. Um, so, so my first idea was um, that I make a five bed all on Swede HML, try and make it nice and hope for the best. And that's what my planning um, drawings were. I applied originally for five on suites and that's how I got the planning agreed. And then once we had the planning and we started talking to conversion, we changed all the plans and ditched all the on suites and completely, it was a whole completely different ball game. And the main reason why is there is a, um, like a design and outlay a guru on our forums on Facebook called Julian Morris. And he did this one post saying, what do you think um, performs better? An all en suite, four bedroom, H uh, five bedroom HMO or a shared bathroom, but with a great design. It was just, uh, it was just, uh, I think he had like a trial and everyone, Almost everyone commented, obviously on sweet, obviously on sweet. There was about 100 comments in there. And then he um, posted his um, numbers on his HMOs. And it was a, that, that was the one that changed my mind. I was like, okay. Because he said that if you design it properly and you create all these wire factors and if you create a nice feel, you don't actually need an ensuite. You can easily have like one bathroom per three uh, for, for example, uh, well, that's the, min that's the maximum. But ideally it's like one to two or one to two and a half. And it will perform just as good, if not better. And everyone disagreed with him. But I was like, we're going to try all that. And that's what we did. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, you, you're quite right. If you ask that question, people say on suites, on suites, on suites. Um, but th 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 there's something in that, definitely, because more and more, certainly from, from my experience and, and other HMO landlords I, I, I talk to, more and more, when tenants are looking at a house, yes, they're interested in the house, but often they're more interested in the community living in that house, who else is living there. Right. And they want the house to look good. They want it to feel like a home and not just somewhere they're coming to sleep so they can enjoy the company of others with well-designed communal areas. Uh, and if that's done properly, I, I, I agree. I think that will very often outweigh 
a house with, uh, you know, five bedrooms and five en suites with less of a tenant community, because, of course, in that environment, people tend to spend more times in their rooms and they're, they're not out, uh, you know, in the kitchen, living room, That's right. uh, in, the, in the community of the house. So, yeah, that makes absolute sense. So you, 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 you bucked the trend and went off and did it that way. And did you, uh, did, did you prove to be right? Was that the right decision? No. I think we just just quickly we will mention one suite is a bad idea in case someone is starting out and they're not really sure because as far as, um there's a few main reasons why on suite probably is not a good especially when you start starting out the main one it costs more money to build a lot more money five on suite versus two bathrooms at least one of them already existing which means you only like in a typical five bedroom HMO you only actually need to build one extra as opposed to four extra. So that's already 10 grand you saved. Secondly, uh, if it's in the room, you won't clean them as often as you would a shared one. My cleaners come to all my houses once a week and they do all bathrooms weekly and I will not have any, any other way. And two years down the line, they all look like new. Generally, they go into the bathroom and it looks like it was finished yesterday. Um, no one on suite will be at the same level because A, you can't clean them every week because it's in their room. You wouldn't have cleaners turning up at their door at seven o'clock in the morning on Wednesday and saying, oh, I'm going to clean them. It's just too intrusive. Three, obviously they're not going to clean them properly every week. I mean, if they're going to clean them properly, I don't know, once a year, they'll be, you know, quite an achievement. They will sort of keep them okay, but not as good as a professional cleaner. And four, one of the main reasons is you need to be aware that some of the council pay particularly good attention to all on suite uh, bedrooms because suddenly they will decide that maybe it is actually a self-contained unit and then before you know it your five bedroom HMO became a five unit HMO instead of one council tax you just got five council tax and the minimum the cheapest you can possibly get to council tax anywhere in the country will be 65 70 pounds a month which is your profit for on suites in the first place completely gone so what was the whole point of on suite in the first place yeah I, everything you're saying is, is spot on and that is a real threat isn't it this um this trend of, of councils deeming bedrooms with on suites is uh, as a self-contained unit and i, I guess that's a <laughs> That is, it. and the last thing, which is also not something to be taken lightly, is most of the rooms in the UK, they are not big enough for en suites. They are not big enough. The minimum, the ideal size room for an HMO, the ideal is 10 square meters. That is, you have to go lower, you can, but ideal is 10. Everything above 14 is amazing. People love rooms above 14 square meters. But, you know, to be realistic, a typical five bed, you can easily have, on average, four, three to four rooms, 10 square meters, and two more, one or two more rooms, the bigger ones. If you start smashing your own suites into this tiny, you make the actual room, what, eight square meters? It's too small. And you have this massive box in the middle of your room. Like, what, what, what is the point of it? There is a lot of, I can keep seeing pictures of people doing en suite, and they don't have enough space for a proper desk what is the point of this what so you can't literally get so you can't go through one door and walk about three seconds into the shared bathroom it's ridiculous so yeah. anyway as you can hear i'm obviously against on suites <laughs> yeah no that's fine um and i can resonate with that a lot of a lot of the properties i have are all en suite but we've also got shared houses with less en suites because we just like mixing things around and spreading risk but what you've said is, is very true, particularly in light. So some of the ensuite rooms we've got, as you say, the ensuite is going to take at least two square meters out of yeah. the bedroom space. And people need larger bedrooms now because there is going to be a trend. Well, there is a trend which will mm -hmm. continue of people working from home. And you have to get a, you have to get a desk into the room. And if you can't get a desk into the room, the tenant is going to think twice about reserving that room ensuite or no ensuite. Oh, exactly. So, um, there is, um, I am, I bought a house just now, my last one, it's going to be an HMO, and it came with two, two en suites, and the, so it's a five bedroom that's got two en suites, and because of the location of these en suites, I can't make them shared, it's, it was too complicated and too expensive trying to model map to make it shared, so I will have to keep those two en suites, but I'm not being, I'm, I'm not building any boxes around 
and uh, and it's going to be I've never seen what I'm going to do I've never seen anywhere like it's probably the one and only HMO en suite with completely open plan with massive it's going to be like glass open plan en suite with a bit of wooden feature but there's no doors and it feels like all one big room with uh you know bathroom utilities in it it's hard to explain you just have to wait one more month till i show it to you but that's that's the only way i could compromise to have a non-suite because otherwise the room's too small and you spend i spend all this time decorating and designing my beautiful bathrooms with all these touches to to keep it under behind the door it was not an option but yeah if it comes with it then you know and it's too complicated to get rid of it uh, and it's already there i'll keep it but to put new ones in no okay great so just um so so that's very useful and um yeah i concur with a lot of what you're saying and uh, i think that's very interesting that that there's a strong argument or rationale for non on suites uh so just back to this first project so that all kicked off um what happened next because am i right in thinking that you before completing that project you then took on some 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 other properties yes that's right so we designed it all i did it very bold and uh, everyone said it was crazy but i was like i know what i'm doing and i was hoping <laughs> this will pay off uh, long story short we rented it out quite quickly uh i have wonderful tenants there um actually 50% of them are actually more 70 i think how many of them three yeah so um yeah out of five rooms yeah 60% of them they are still there my first tenants are still there so two years um they're still in my chimo even though chimo is like a temporary technically temporary living people stay on average there year year and a half um i had sorry i had more than one um so I had them staying there full time for two years. So that's a good result. And then just when we were finishing it, we had to move out, out of our house, the first one, which we bought, because we did it all up, we finished it, and we decided to rent it out because the mortgage was coming to an end. So I either either had to stay on like a on a like either renew mortgage or stay in the variable rate or do something with it and I was like well we're not going to stay here um I'm not going to get any more fixed rate so we just have to move out <laughs> and so I rented so we decided to rent that as a single in the end we decided to rent it as a single let because we a we didn't I didn't really want to spend more money on converting it into an HMO because it wouldn't be a great five bed it would be a either a good four bed or a terrible just a terrible five bed because it's just too small and I don't do too small it needs to be somewhere where I was happy to stay so in the end it was decided because the price has gone up and we did the work to it I could uh, mortgage it and get all my all my money out so I thought well it's great we're just going to rent single I don't worry about it I don't have to you know convert into something it's not and that's what we did and at the same time there was this amazing opportunity came on the market with under commercial so just another tip if you are on the right move you ideally need to check everything that's come on the market not just you know a terraced house just anything because sometimes the estate agents put it under all sorts of headaches which you wouldn't see if you filter it so two houses came absolute dream houses like dream home level houses came and they were with the same owner for 65 years has never been on the market before and the problem with them is they had to come together so it's two huge houses on huge plots of land like half an acre land each and you had to buy them it was a sealed bead and you had to propose how you're going to buy both of them even though it was a split title so there were two separate houses but they just wanted to sell them in one go and, and we noticed it and I went and the, the asking price was like insane I was like I don't know how we're going to buy it but I'm going to go and view it anyway so I went and viewed it 
And I came back home and I said, Josh, I don't know how we're going to buy, but we need to buy it. It's amazing. It's like something like this comes up once in 20 years. We need to find money. I don't know where, but we need to find money and we need to buy it. So we sat down and we did the research. It was quite hard to come with an estimate um, because of where it is and it's prime, but it's in a terrible state and you don't really know what to do. Anyway, I was like, we're going to write a bid, uh, we're going to submit it and then see what happens. So there's a lot of just see, just do it and see what happens in this story. <laughs> wow. So just to get this right, these two properties came up. You had no idea how you were going to finance them. That's you were right. determined to get them. So you sat down with your partner, Josh, and put an offer forward. Yeah. So we put an offer for two of them. And hope for the best and we we didn't quite knew how we're gonna buy there but we're like well if we get it we'll find a way so long story short because there was only seven people who applied seven right this is a prime property in in southeast kent seven people only applied three of them were complete four of them apparently were complete time wasters that's what the agent told me i don't know how he figured it out but i was like yeah, we're, we're perfectly serious. <laughs> and um, he he came back to me and he said, well, the interesting thing happened. I'm terribly sorry, but one of the other bidders, she said, I will buy all these houses for X amount of money or at the like a small print, she said, I'll buy one for this. And now the vendors wanted to come back to all of you who originally applied to seven of us and say, maybe you can do your best and final for each individual house and specify which one you want, like left or right one. And I was like, well, suddenly things are starting a lot, a lot brighter because buying one house was a lot more feasible than buying two. And we went back, so we went back to the drawing board and we made a offer and an offer was accepted. It just happened that out of all these seven people, only one, uh, one of us, wanted one house and she wanted the left one and I wanted the right one and together we were offering just a bit more than the other people for two. It's interesting isn't it because often when you're looking at properties agents will say oh there's lots of people bidding here there and everywhere and you, you get this kind of impression that it's very unlikely you're going to be up against 10 other people all in a similar situation to yourself but the reality is that as you've just said often there are a number of, of time wasters and, and and the chances are often greater than uh, than they may seem at the outset. But what I really like about what you've just told me is most people would have probably just backed off, not done anything. Oh, it's too expensive. It's too much for us at the moment. Um, activity creates results, doesn't it? Because mm. had you not taken those steps, that opportunity never would have come about. And it's really a story of fortune favoring the brave, isn't it? Because it all turned out exactly yes, as you well. Yeah, so even though it was still a huge risk, it was a lot of money for us at the time, and there was a small complication with it. To be kind of stand out, we said it's going to be cash, so we had to complete in six weeks. And I was like, well, it's great when we have about 10% of the, how much did we have? I think, no, we had 20% of the purchase price in the bank. And I was like, well, we just need to find 80%. That's all we need to do. Surely we can find it somehow. Um, and so that's the time when I had to uh, consider how I'm going to get bridge. I, I heard of bridge. I knew it was very expensive and very risky. Um, that's all I knew because that's not something you find out about really. You know, nobody really does bridge unless you're in the property market, in, in the property field and, you know, some friends. So I started reaching out, just trying even to find a broker who does bridge because it's unregulated and who does it and is it reliable? Are you going to get it? You don't know. So, well, long story short, uh, in order to, to complete this purchase in six weeks, we had a flat in London, which was coming up for um, renewal. The mortgage was running out. So uh, we had to revalue it. And I was hoping at the time that we agreed to buy it, that the, the remortgage for the flat will come through on time. We will also... Uh, have bridge on time and hopefully our deposit will be enough and all these things had to happen within six weeks or and we also let our current house out so we will had to be out 
by the time all this happens. Only four things and a nine month old on my lap had to happen all in one place. But it did. Yeah, so it all happened really well, but it was a rather stressful, rather stressful time. Wow, so you're juggling a nine month old, raising yes. finance, probably your head was going round and round in terms of creative ideas and putting this project together and in terms of how you wanted it to look and how you wanted it to end up. So just carry on with that journey with this so, project. Uh, the only, yeah, the, the, the best, the carry on this thing is like four weeks before we're supposed to complete, they call us and they say, oh, by the way, um, there's a small complication with the house. Oh, we had a flood. Yeah, well, how bad is a flood? Um, well, there was a water tank um, upstairs on the third floor, and it's been yeah, it's been overflowing for three days. So the same very house which I agreed to buy just now on the bridge had a water coming from the ceiling on the top floor down to the very floor for three days nonstop, like a nonstop nice waterfall. Um, and I was supposed to have it valued the next week and the valuation officer came in and left about, I think it was three minutes in the house. He says, um, is this some sort of a joke? There is huge water damage. I'm leaving. And he literally walked out just like that. <laughs> I was like, um, what's it all about? Now I know that I should have probably had a go at him and saying, I'm sorry, what, what, what do you think this is? Uh, this sounds out of a part-time job arrangement when you just turn up and you do what you want. But then because the bridge insisted they wanted some formal valuation, I couldn't get it from three different people because they just wouldn't give it to me. It's like, well, I don't know. It's lots of water damage. It's a very complicated case. It's not our problem. And everyone kept fobbing me off. It was great fun. Highly recommend Gosh, okay. <laughs> so uh, eventually you found finance? Eventually, yeah. Eventually I managed to basically force my way into one local guy to just give me, I had the survey done separately. I didn't really care about survey because I was like, whatever the survey does, I'm going to buy it anyway. It's that good. It's perfect. Even it's falling apart. I don't care. But I needed to get it done for bridge anyway. And then I had to go to a separate person who will just turn up for five minutes, ask for 600 pounds and give me a valuation on a piece of paper so I can give it to the bridge. It's also a waste of money, but got me the bridge in the end. And then... The other complication was, well, obviously, if you have a bridge and it's on a fixed term and it's an insane amount of money, we were hoping that we will have enough time to finish all the remedial works we need just to get a normal mortgage and close the bridge. Uh, and obviously, after having a flood, it kind of complicated things a little bit. And uh, I've never done this before. And it was a mad rush trying to, because we had bridge for three months. So in three months, we had to do all of this. And in the end, we also let our other house. So we had to move in here when it was like half Delaric with a baby, with concrete everywhere, with water damage, and just trying to patch it up just enough so we can have a normal mortgage and just close that bridge and, you know, just breathe. So that's what we did. So you got there in the end? We got there in the end. So we got there in the end and it was all fine. And we got our uh, we got our normal mortgage. And then we finished um, our so we finished our other HMO. So by then we had a single led HMO dream house, which I was not hoping to get for another 10 years, but I was 20, well, how old was it? 29. I was 29, I got my dream home. So I was very pleased with the result. And then we decided it's time to buy a new one. So we need to buy a new HMO. That sounds like a feasible working solution after all this stress. I need to buy another HMO. And that's how we got our second one. Okay, now what we haven't discussed or touched on is at what stage did you leave your career? Mm, I moved, so I, I was commuting for a year and a half when we moved here because um, we needed as much money as uh, as possible so I was commuting for a year and a half so I left I left before we bought the dream house so I left um so I got pregnant and I had baby and just didn't come back right and by then you you had enough income from property to replace your salary um it, it was yeah because we had when did we have it um well, we had enough household income, but I knew we had already achieved more in the pipeline. So um, 
it was fine in terms of, I mean, I could have technically, no, I don't think I could have, it would have been too complicated to like, you know, commute. Because at the time you couldn't really work from home. Uh, but one HMO after, yeah, that's fine. One HMO, one single letter, it was enough to leave, to leave my job. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? So those risks that you've taken and the time and energy you've put in, it's really quite rewarding, particularly if you've got a young child, you want more flexible lifestyle, you want to be your own boss. Uh, yeah, a couple of properties and you can be well on your way, can't you, to being in well, that Well, if you situation. have a properly run HMO, even one one good, you know, properly run five bed in the Southeast HMO, is is basically like an average um, job income, you know, through the UK. And if you have two, then you are, you know, like my other one is a seven bed one. Yeah, and that's um, the profit on that one is almost double than the five bed one. It's complicated why, but we can talk about it, like why. But yeah, if it's if it's all done properly and you know your numbers and you're in the right area and you know you have enough uh, stamina to do it, yes, it is very rewarding. But whew, it's a it's a bit of it's a lot of graft. That's that's how I can uh, describe it. So I've seen a lot of your designs uh, on Facebook and other social media. Very eye catching, very bold. Often the topic of conversation. But what what I've particularly taken on board about what you've been saying earlier on is you were talking about a tower, which is essentially two rooms on one floor, then another two on the next floor, and then two going up. And I really like that because. If you've got lots of rooms on one floor, so three, four bedrooms on the first floor or ground floor, and the bedroom is kind of off the kitchen or off the living room, and you've got the the rooms and the living space just jumbled up, it's not very endearing for someone necessarily living in that property, because they're going to be worried about noise in the kitchen and living room and those sort of things. But I really like that idea of two rooms. It's almost like a mini community, isn't it, on on each floor, and you, you just feel a little bit more private. But it's all, yes, it's that. And it's also, it's very easy to plan then. And it's very easy to put en suites onto them because not en suites, sorry, the shared rooms, uh, the shared bathroom. So my ideal scenario is you have two rooms and you have a bathroom in between them. Not the Jack and Jill, obviously, you know, Jack and Jill, but like a normal one when you come out and there is one bathroom and then you have another room on top, you just calm down. And this is the easiest way to build a night. It's, it's thin, it's only 1.2 meters uh, wide and um, the length of the room long but it's perfect size you have a it's easy to build you have this big shower at the end of it you know the whole width of the room it's big shower 1200 is big shower um you have a sink and a toilet alongside so it creates a space over of, of a decent bathroom and obviously yeah the fact that you don't have that many people then you will only the only person you will know really you know really well is the one who lives next door and a lot of them work different shifts from very different walks of life and um, they may not even see you know other people from other floors for a long time which kind of creates the impression that you live in a smaller house than you actually do only you get this you know nice features of a big houses and like big kitchen a big lounge big hallway and five bathrooms well not toilets so that's the like yeah layout is very important layout is um second most important way because some some houses just the way they're built is just not worth converting into an hmo it's going to be too cramped it's it's too complicated it's too expensive i am a firm believer it needs to be as easy as possible some houses i will I'll, the houses i bought before i looked in the floor plan and i was like perfect that's what I want. You look at the floor plan, you're not trying, you know, to design a wheel, you reinvent the wheel, you're just looking at it like this is all easily split, you know, spending like five minutes figuring out where the bedroom is, where the bathroom go. That's it. You know, is the one when it takes five minutes to design it. Completely. There's so many people who they're looking at a floor plan and they're wanting to try and cram as many rooms in as they can and they're looking at, you know, the highest yield they can get and all those sort of things. And I, I just don't, in th- that, that may have worked five years ago, but I think in this day and age, tenants are looking for so much more and it's really important to uh, to have the well, right Well, yeah, especially right after time. pandemic. I think, I think actually HMO, I think HMO business has gained a lot from the pandemic. Um, I don't know whatever well, those things, but I think it's actually good for us because we have suddenly people who, I had, personally, I had uh, literally a queue of people standing out for my last HMO because they didn't want to sit in a flat for six months on their own. 
And they were so glad that they have similar minded people in the same house with them. So they had a Christmas dinner together and then they had a Thanksgiving together and they were all there. They had like their own party of seven where you're not allowed to see anyone. They had their own, you know, party of seven people because that was their bubble. Completely spot on. So, Maria Louise, you've got six properties, four of which are HMOs, so you're well underway in your property journey. What, uh, what has been your biggest challenge so far, and what advice would you give to anybody wanting to get into HMOs and, 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 and start up their own HMO journey? So the biggest challenge is obviously builders. That's the hardest bit. Not the planning, not the layout, not the tenants not even the design, is the builders. Builders is the ones that are gonna make all the difference to how stressful it is, how smoothly it runs. So there's not really much you can do about builders apart from trial and error. You will have to accept that when you start out, it probably be a terrible builder and you will have to change them at some point and you'll have to be there every day and watch what they do and try and negotiate. And as you are with time, you know, it's just experience with time, you'll get bolder, you know exactly what you want, you'll figure out yourself if he's doing the right thing or not. You know what's a good finish is to a bad finish very quickly. And with time, it just becomes better. But as you start out, just try and minimize the damage. That's all you can do, really. If you know he is taking the mickey, he's not there, he's unreliable, he says he will do this, he doesn't do this. And then before you know it, it's like terribly run. Just cut your losses, get rid of him, try and get someone else. And eventually, you know, five years down the line, and with a few gray hairs, you'll get someone good. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? And it's a lot of trial and error and um, relationship building. And I think the important thing uh, is there's definitely going to be mistakes on the way. There's defi definitely going to be poor decisions. You can only make the best decision that you can on the information that you have. Um, but yeah, it's tough. But what you can do, and just some advice to anybody uh, listening to this podcast, is there's some simple things you can do. And, and that is, tr if you start off by treating all your tradespeople with respect, paying them on time, you know, having a chat with them about their lives and everything else, that will do no end and good. That'll do no end of good in terms of just uh, making sure you're doing everything you can to, to build up a positive uh, relationship. And the more you can do that, the better they are to work for you, I find. Yes, no, that, that's true. I mean, the majority of them will appreciate it. And the only bad problem about it is because we have we are literally in the building room right now so they pick and choose who they want to work for so you know it's hard to stand out when you might be particularly like picky about what you want because now they're the king now they decide how you know they have so many clients standing up that you know that kind of makes them a bit lazy and lousy as well um but you know just do your best just try and do your best there will be mistakes you will overpay just have to admit and like make your peace that you will eventually you have to you are pay a little bit here you underpay a little bit there you may overpay overall on your first one some of the decisions won't be very good by the end of the day it will be fine as long as you're moving forward you learn it you will avoid it next time eventually you know the universe will help you and get some decent builders but builders for the first two ones i had was absolutely awful i mean they weren't cover builders and they weren't necessarily bad people they just were bad professional people yeah i think it's definitely a case of uh planning for the worst hoping for the best you might get yeah. lucky <laughs> basically yeah. Yeah. that's right Great. Um, so just before we finish off, is there any other tips or advice, Maria Louise, that you can give to anybody listening to this podcast who's thinking, yes, I'm really wanting to get into HMOs and they may be at the beginning of their journey. Is there anything else? Well, there's one thing which uh, I haven't heard anyone else saying, but um, everyone needs to understand that everything within your area you can improve. So the whole idea that, oh, no, there's too many HMOs here or there's too many... Uh, you know, all I can see, it's irrelevant. You can improve anything, like literally anything. You go into the area, even if it's saturated, 90% of them will be awful. Okay, maybe not awful, but 
mediocre and at least 50% of them will be awful. Go into right move or spare room into any area and look at what's for rent. Look at it. The where I am, 90% of them is called still magnolia walls and some awful semi-broken furniture. It's not even cheap to rent. It's not like, oh, you have a really nice boutique chimo for 600 pounds, or you can have a drag den for 200 pounds. No, you can have a drag den for 450 pounds on a really nice one for 575. So the difference is only 100 pounds. Um, and you get three times better. So don't worry about the whole oversaturation thing. And also remember that even if you get your first HMO, it's only five people, five or six or seven, it's only seven people in a town of what, 40,000, 50,000, 150,000 people, you will find your five people. So I wouldn't worry about the whole demand thing because as long as people are living there, you will have your demand. So don't worry about that. As long as you design the best product you can possibly offer, Decent Wi-Fi, amazing heating, amazing shower pressure, a good landlord. And before you know it, you will have these people saying, oh, hi, is this our favorite landlord oh, you know, of the whole world? That's what you want to do. Treat them, uh, your tenants, as your customers. Just something, give them amazing service and amazing house to live in, and you will find your people. Yeah, I concur with that. There, there is definitely a lot more HMOs than they were, um, but as you've just said, a lot of them are mediocre and there's there's a plenty of opportunity to be better than the competition. But I think there's a need these days to think of all the things you've just mentioned. Um, gone are the days where any HMO is going to work in any location. You need to really think about the location and then take on board all those comments um, that you've just come up with as well um so maria louisa it's been great having you on this podcast thank you very much for joining us thank you uh for those listening thank you for listening to this podcast for more podcasts subscribe to our channel hmo matters and do check out our website www.hmomatters.co.uk thank you for joining us